We've got another uh, panel to bring you now, the first, in fact, uh, of these uh, two days here at Worcester Park. And we have uh, some newcomers on, on stage here. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Aurore Julien from UEL. Nice to see you. Can you just give us a, a brief sort of resume of, of, of what you do and, um, and, and the, the business you're in? Okay, so I work for the University Office London. Um, I currently work on a project called Eastern New Energy. You might have seen some of, of our ads uh, in the back. Um, I'm a research manager for that project. My specialization is in buildings, energy efficiency, uh, and low carbon buildings. Thank you very much indeed. We'll get back to you in just a few moments, Doctor. Um, next up, we have Stephen Fendley from the East of England Co-op. Just a quick word from you, Stephen, as by way of an introduction, please. Um, this is working? Possibly not. Shall we move across to Lewis while we get that sorted out from uh, Kronos Technology? Lewis, good to see you. Hi there, thank you. Good morning. Um, so I work for Kronos Technology, and we have a focus on smart buildings, not just smart buildings, but smart environments. Um, we are heavily data focused, um, pulling data sources from everything in a building, and we have, we have this interest in existing buildings and existing data, everything on the network, and the stories that are being told between the data sources. And you can pull all of these and put them in this nice holistic view um, which gives you insights about your energy usage, the behavioral patterns of staff, and how that really affects your business, you know, business-wide, so sort of from customer experience to going carbon neutral. Um, and so we use these, and you can set parameters and reports and detailing to really hone in on how you can control your carbon impact. So that's, that's the effective, uh, there's a lot to it. Um, there's so much more to it, and it involves IoT as well and technology adoption. So we monitor all of this, and you can tell from the start to the finish where you meet your goals how you progress along as well. Thank you very much indeed. We've already met uh, Nigel Davies, of course, from Muntins, just heard him on his feet. And also we heard earlier from Shivali Matur from Bayes. And uh, also we have back, of course, uh, Peter Goody from the Greater Southeast Energy Hub. So uh, welcome back. To, to the trio to the left of, of what I'm, who, who I'm talking to. Um, how realistic then is net zero? This is an expression that everyone's familiar with, but realistically, you know, can we get there? We'll start with you, Doctor, perhaps? Um, well, I think um, it depends. <laughs> um, we have the technology, that's for sure. We've had the technology for a long time. I'm actually just repeating the word from uh, somebody called Professor Jim Ski who um, is at the IPCC and has been for a long time. Um, so, so we have the technology. The, the question is whether we're putting the means into it. Um, so I think that's a short answer to the question. Okay. And, uh, and what about you, Stephen? Oh, is, is, is this on yet? No, it's not on yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. It might, it might work soon. No. no. Battery's flat, probably. Okay, hopefully we'll get something sorted there. Um, in which case, um, Lewis, you're coming to my rescue. Oh, I beg your pardon, back. we're here now, Stephen. So net zero for, for us, we've, as a company, we've committed to be carbon neutral uh, by 2030 with scopes one and two by 2025. Um, the reason we've gone carbon neutral at the moment is because we really don't know what the net zero looks like. So we are going to have to employ some offsetting. Like someone mentioned earlier, offsetting is at the bottom of our hierarchy rather than at the top. So we need to really reduce our emissions and, any, and improve on efficiencies first. Um, but yeah, I think we can get there, but it will be a combination of reduction and offsetting. Okay, Lewis? I'd agree. I think that's a really strong point um, because it's a very difficult journey. Some companies we work with, you know, have managed to reach net zero, um, but it's not through just efficiencies alone. Um, I think they play a huge part in, in getting there um, in terms of, you know, looking at using your own renewable energy. Um, I think to put that's entirely dependent on the footprint of your environment as well. Um, but I think it, you know, quite heavily relies on renewable energy that you um, consume as well. Um, just as from the grid or solar 
or um, wind power as well, say if it's an agricultural setting. But it is possible, it is possible. We know, we know it's possible. Um, it's making sure that across a lot of different settings that we can manage it there as well. Nigel, we've heard from you already, clearly Muntons are, are well on top of, of what's going on at the moment, but of course some businesses will be burying their head in the sand or certainly dragging their heels. Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely true. Is that, sorry, is that on? Not sure that's yeah. on, is it? It's on, I think. It's on now, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's it's interesting. Some businesses, you know, they uh, I, I don't like offset offsetting. So I'm saying put put offsetting right to the very last choice. Some businesses have actually said if we use offsetting as our first choice, we have to pay for those offsets. That develops a big financial penalty for the business. Therefore, we've got to work really hard because they're saying they think that drives business leaders more than the carbon. I think that's very brave, but you're talking about companies that have got uh, plenty of money and they use their CSR investment fund to buy the offsets. So they would have spent that money anyway. I think it's, uh, it's not a strategy that most businesses could do to, to spend all that money on offsets, particularly when if you look even this year, it's gone from 25 euros per ton to, to 60 plus euros per ton. Most businesses couldn't do it, but it's an interesting co concept. Um, just an earlier question I put to um, the previous guests here. How realistic is net zero then, in, in your view? I, I think we've got a lot of uh, opportunities to get there. I, I think it just depends on your mindset. So you can, you can get there if you just get out of that uh, pattern of thinking it's somebody else's job to get there, or it's too difficult, or we need new technology. All of those things are incorrect starting points. You can do a lot yourself. Okay. Peter, you spoke passionately earlier um, to, to the room here, and um, presumably you think it's realistic. I, I could tell that you, you certainly believe in it, but can we get there? I mean, it's a question of who's we. You know, reductively, individual households, businesses can take that step and can achieve it, whether it's through on-site emissions reduction or where they can't achieve that emissions reduction through other means. And, uh, and I take your point about offsetting, and uh, I'm, I'm with you on that one. The question is around fairness and justice. You know, this is not a tech, we've got the technical solutions, but how do we deal with this as a societal issue, not just in Ipswich or Suffolk or UK, but globally. And we have a challenging environment around fossil fuels. We've seen uh, some of the lobbying that's going on around COP26, it was ever thus. There are lobbying, there are interests with regard to the current business model around fossil fuels. Um, we survived on that fossil fuel and it's built a fantastic opportunity to get out of um, what is a lifestyle that was probably medieval, pre-industrial. So we need to think around, well, we've got to build on that opportunity. Okay, we've got a problem we need to address, but we've demonstrated that we can address other issues of this global nature. Um, the COVID pandemic is one we're wrestling with at the moment. Um, we looked at um, the issue around ozone depletion and CFCs as a challenge, but we need to make this a societal issue. And that's the big journey that we have to go on. So, yes, we can solve it. The question is, do we want to? Have we got the means? And are we prepared to take some of the new routes that are available to us? Mr. Shivali, surely as you know, a world issue now, we've got to solve it, haven't we? Time is not on our side. Agreed. But if I first go on personal views on this a little bit, if we, if we just rewind ourselves 15 years back, um, in all honesty, I used to spend no more than 60, 70 quid on my mobile phone. I could never imagine spending a grand on a phone. It, that was the reality, and I, would, I wouldn't even think that my life was the phone. Um, but it has changed. It really changed overnight, I would say. The whole iPod situation, the iPhone situation, the youth wanted it. We want it. My parents want it. it it's every, everybody wants it. And it's just not only fashion. It's comfort as well. We can see emails everywhere. We can talk and communicate to loved ones everywhere. So I think... If we connect ourselves, and I think the youth is connecting, that if we do not change where we are now and where we want to be, and it, it won't happen. I mean, it won't be a better place to live. So there is that societal issue, as you said, Peter. And I, I know that people are getting more and more aware. Um, why are people going plant-based or vegan sort of a thing? So there is a drive from other side as well, because we were, we were unhealthy a few years back as well. But now it's, no, we, know, we can't kill so many animals, etc. So from a personal perspective, I feel that, yes, there is momentum, there is impetus, as you said, Peter, then we, we can reach the goal. 
Um, from Bay's perspective, and I reflect back again on the net zero strategy where we've talked a lot about build back better. Um, it is about market mechanisms. So we have to enable the market mechanisms somehow as, as government, which we are working with industry. Consumer behaviors, they need to change and evolve, and we as consumers need to evolve. Um, and, and again, investments. So it's, it's all in together, I think, I think you mentioned, Stephen, um, and collaborative effort, which can make the change. I mean, certainly businesses here in the UK have had so much to, to cope with, haven't they, over the past few years? Obviously, Brexit, uh, the pandemic, and now they're being asked to do more you know, for the environment. So can businesses cope with all that at the moment? Doctor, <laughs> I'll come round to you again. I mean, I do definitely think that um, the fact that businesses are being asked to do more is a very positive point. Um, because the, the, the sort of, it's always been about individual making consumer choices as to um, you know, whether they would choose the greener product or not. Um, and, and often this greener product would come with a higher price tag. Um, and this is, I think, a little bit of a warped vision of how we can save carbon. Um, I believe that we can save carbon through changing how companies work and certainly how they themselves can you know, become zero carbon, will definitely influence the products that we purchase or that we use uh, through our own business activities. So um, this, this sort of pressure on businesses is certainly um, what needs to be done rather than uh, just simply the consumers. Consumers um, have been demonstrated to not have that much impact. Um, even during the, the sort of first stages of the COVID crisis, we were not saving so much carbon whilst we weren't traveling as much, weren't taking planes as much. So the change was really small. But we do know that if companies, small and large companies, make efforts to save carbon, then things are going to change. Now, whether they can, um, I think, um, I think is a difficult question. Uh, they certainly can have a go, and we see plenty um, examples of companies that successfully. Uh, reduce their carbon emissions very fast. And there is a little bit of time, if we really think about it. 2050 is in a while. Um, and Stephen, the, the, sorry, the, the East of England co-op, obviously, in some ways, uh, have led the way. Certainly, that, that's a perception I get. But have you seen more customers coming to you because of your green stance? Um, very definitely. We're a cooperative, so sustainable um, business and corporate responsibility goes right back to the sort of birth of the co-ops and the Rochdale pioneers. Um, we're led by, our, we're owned by our members, we're led by our members and they expect us to be taking action on our carbon footprint and on environmental issues. Get, on um, sort of tech, We're getting many, many requests now for EV charges, which we're rolling out across the estate. Um, the, the, expert, the amount of crews get about plastic bags, etc. cetera, um, yeah. Our, our customers have an expectation of us, which we, we need to meet. Hmm. Okay, Lewis, as far as you're concerned, I mean, that, that, that's a big plus point, isn't it, for any, any business to be seen to be green and to be doing something about it. But some are going to struggle, aren't they, to keep up with all this? I think so. It's, a, it's very challenging. Um, I think if the past two years have taught us anything, it's that we handle challenges by um, being diverse and flexible um, and it, it also leads to the fact that progress is very slow. It's almost too slow uh, in terms of reducing carbon footprint and discovering how we can all make a change. Um, I think as well, um, businesses at the moment seem to be, you know, companies that push the fact that they are sustainable if they've got sustainable products that are made from recycled materials. It's now a plus and a selling point and a plus point to be in that scenario. I think also for them to, um, to take on new technologies and become more sustainable, um, you've got, we like to focus on there being a financial um, benefit to it as well. And that the fact that there is now money coming out for companies um, to improve, uh, the idea of saving money as well. So it's not just, you know, um, we have to buy all of this new technology. We can turn these lights off. We can turn some of them. And I look at this from a very individual level. That's sort of, um, that's, that's where I focus on making the change. Um, 
And there is, there is money to be saved, which I think will massively help, and that will encourage a lot of businesses to um, take a step in the right direction. Okay. We're coming to the end of the morning session. I think we could possibly take one or two questions um, if anybody would like to put something to the panel, get their views on something that I haven't um, broached. Gentleman at the back there, we'll hand you a microphone in just a moment, and hopefully um, we can hear you okay. I'm sure we will be. Uh, hello. Um, hello. I'm Peter Ellington from Triple Bottom Line Accounting. Um, my question is, everybody's talking about energy transition. Um, what does the panel uh, think about social transition and what needs to happen in society and how might that change happen? Social transition, who wants to, to give us their views on how that's going to happen? <laughs> it's a big question. Yes, they're all big questions. <laughs> I'm reading a book by James Plunkett called End State, and uh, that talks, for example, of that one of the transitions that needs to take place is a, a UBI, so that people that have less money actually do have the ability to take, make consumption choices because, as people have said, um, environmental choices are often more expensive. Generally, they're getting cheaper, but there needs to be a whole new um, adopt, adaptation to how we see money and finance so that poorer members of the society and all of society can participate in a new greener economy. So, uh, so really, okay, instead of a question, I pose that as a challenge. Um, do you agree and how do you, that society needs to change quite fundamentally and how do you see that change taking place? Um, there's two things that, um it, what you're saying makes me think about. The first thing is what I was saying earlier about environmental choices and the fact that when you choose as a consumer a green product, it's inevitably going to have a price tag, and it should not. And, um, so so this, this kind of puts um, a sort of, you know, it becomes the, the green choices become almost, almost the privilege of the, who, you know, the people who can. Um, and so this is why um, it's so important to have um, aims to, be, to have you know, companies becoming zero carbon in the long run. And I hope this is going to be um, put in place strongly uh, in the future. There is movement to, in that direction, but um, it's very important. But there's another aspect of social behavior which is really important, which is brought by not just the simple um, choices of you know, choosing this washing machine or that washing machine. Um, it's about um, how we use the things we use, how we, you know, beyond the rebound effect, the fact that, for example, when we um, wash our clothes, we wash our clothes more and more, more and more often. So whether we uh, wash them at 30 degrees or 40 degrees doesn't matter anymore because simply we wash them almost every couple of days. Um, and these are very embedded within so society and practices of how we do things. Um, and these are the, the things that are the most difficult to change, really. Um, and so um, it's very important also, and certainly in academia, that there is an understanding um, of, of these behaviors and how to um, you know, direct advertisement in a way which is not going to change how people, so how people um, behave. So for example, there, is, there has been loads of advertisement quite a long time ago in sort of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, around the concept of white clothes that were very clean and smelt really nice. And you could see all these people on television, you know, smelling the wonderful clothes that smelt great because they came out of the washing machine. That has changed how people behave. Um, and there needs to be a really good understanding of how these things happen so that whilst we do improve the energy efficiency of the systems we use, we also understand how people will use those systems. And that's, that's important as well. I think it's a long answer to your <laughs> question. But. No, it made perfect sense. <laughs> I think from an ecosystem perspective, 2015 net zero energy system. And if we look from here to there, um, sorry, I didn't catch your name. But it's data and transparency as well, education, 
Um, how many of, um, and you, I'm super impressed by Nigel's story of carbon accounting. Um, and if there is a model that can be used simply, it's quite inspirational. So sharing the positive, true, inspiring stories. Um, so I, I, I worked on a project in my previous life, to, uh, previous to Bayes, um, and we changed from boilers to heat pumps. And now and again, the same question of why my radiator is not burning hot was a question I answered to 500 plus consumers. And I just felt that the behavior would so, and, and the behavior changed the moment they understood how the heat pump really works. And this is a few years back. And that's why the radiator is not getting that burning hot and it doesn't need to as long as the temperatures of the room are fine. That changed their uh, attitude to looking at, um, at the problem which they were looking at before. So I think it's the more we can get transparent on the data, the more we can educate the system, make people aware, share our stories, that will help the social behavior, um, the consumers to change, I feel. And we all do like to hear, um, so I, I'm thinking of an electric vehicle just because three of my friends are really happy about using it. And I have some stories that yes, they've done this way. This is how I, now accessibility. If I want to buy a heat pump, where do I go? How do I do it? Um, who do I go if I have to service it? So I think that information is key um, in transition. Okay, Stephen, just briefly. The cooperatives have, uh, as a cooperative, we, we have a responsibility to help drive that change. Our uh, principles of shared equity and concern for the community, we need to provide opportunity to our customers, to our communities with the provision of EV, with good products, ethically sourced products, um, and with education as well. We're uniquely placed within the heart of our community, communities to allow us to get that message to where it needs to be and drive society, societal change. Thank you very much indeed. Apologies, we'll have to leave it there because uh, we've approached the lunch break now and I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, would like a, a bite to eat. But thank you very much indeed for taking part in our first panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you.